Um, we're going to start our afternoon session, uh, but first, uh, Dr. Riley asked to have a word. Yes, I just want to go on record as saying in the last, in the first vote that we had, um, question number one of was I voting for um, the new subunit, my answer really was yes. I was jumping ahead in my thought process in thinking about a preferential um, uh, recommendation. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Whoop. Sorry, I'm turning this on and off. Um, we're back from lunch and we're starting with influenza vaccines and Dr. Walter is on board. Good afternoon. Now that everybody is post-prandial, I will try and wake you up and let the next next session. And influenza is never boring. We know that. So. <clears throat> so I'd just like to acknowledge our influenza working group, uh, Lisa Groskoff, uh, who's our lead for the influenza group, uh, as well as the other ACIP members, Ed Belanja and Peter Salagi, the ex-officio members, consultants, and liaisons. So just uh, to recap from the last uh, June meeting, at that meeting, we had an update on U.S. influenza surveillance. We had an update on vaccine effectiveness and vaccine safety. And uh, at that meeting, we discussed and voted on proposed 2017-18 recommendations for influenza. They were subsequently published on August 25th of this year. Since that time, we've met twice weekly and uh, had call, or twice, twice a month, excuse me, not twice weekly. <laughs> I could only dream that, right? Um, so, and the call highlights, uh, we've had updates on the live attenuated uh, quadrivalent flu mist vaccine uh, from uh, call with Metamune, and we've had updates on the vaccine safety data link study of spontaneous abortions uh, and inactivated uh, flu vaccine. These data were uh, previously presented at ACIP uh, in June and uh, were subsequently just recently published uh, in vaccine. Uh, today's meeting, uh, the agenda is that we're going to have an influenza surveillance update from Ms. Lynette Bramer here at CDC. F following that, we'll have an influenza vaccine coverage update by Dr. Carla Black here at uh, the CDC. Uh, after that, you will hear a presentation um, from Metamune given by Dr. Mal uh, Dr. Mallory. Uh, looking at uh, LAIV uh, efficacy and effectiveness for the 2016-17 season, and also looking at the strain selection update for the current LAIV vaccine. Uh, after that, we'll have a talk uh, given by Dr. Jim Donahue from the Marshfield Clinic, looking at the risk of spontaneous abortion following administration of inactivated flu vaccine. And then uh, Lisa will come up and give a summary and work group considerations. There are no votes today. So uh, given that, I'll turn it over to Lynette. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, this afternoon, I'll provide an update on international influenza activity and recent U.S. influenza activity, and then talk briefly about the Southern vaccine, vaccine composition recommendations made last month for the Southern Hemisphere. Um, starting off with international influenza activity, um, these two graphs are from the WHO website. It's reports from the National Influenza Centers around the world. The one on top is the Northern Hemisphere number of influenza positives, and the bottom is the Southern Hemisphere. The thing to see here is, you know, influenza activity occurred at the times we expected it to occur, but in both the Northern, Southern, Northern and Southern Hemispheres, the predominant virus was the um, influenza A, H3, and 2 viruses, which are this sort of medium blue, followed by influenza B activity in the more orange colors. If you look at a couple of examples from the southern hemisphere, 
Um, on top is Australia and South Africa, and the two bottom countries are Argentina and Chile. You can see that although there are some differences, for all the predominant viruses, H3N2. Um, if you want to see influenza H1N1 activity, you have to look a little bit harder, but there are areas of the world that are still seeing H1N1 activity. Um, in Southeast Asia, that looks like their predominant virus recently. And in Southeast Asia, they have also seen H1N1 activity, although in the more recent weeks, it looks like they're converting over to H3N2 like everybody else. Um, moving on to U.S. activity, this slide shows influenza positives reported to us by clinical labs across the country. This data is from October 2nd of last year through October 14th of this year. The first thing to note on the larger graph is that relative to last winter, we are still seeing very low influenza activity. Um, and with the insert, you can see a little bit more clearly the recent activity. It does look like it's uptrending just a little bit, and um, but it's still very low. In the week ending October 14th, only 2.2% of the specimens tested by clinical labs were positive for influenza. This next show, slide shows the um, more detailed virus information from the U.S. public health laboratories for the same time period. Again, very low activity compared to what we see in the winter. Um, but you can see it is increasing in recent weeks. Um, for the first two weeks of this season, um, the two weeks ending with October 14th, um, 87% of the viruses seen by public health labs are influenza A's, and of those that are subtyped, which is almost all of them, 92% um, of those are H3N2 viruses. To get a little bit more detailed, we'll look at the genetic um, characterization data for the influenza viruses collected over the summer and through the current period. And you can see the pie chart on the left is the relative proportions of viruses reported by public health labs. And then on the right is the more detailed information for each subtype. Um, starting with the H3N2s, we are, the 3C2A and 2A1 genetic groups and subgroup are the predominant here in the US and really worldwide. Um, while from country to country, the relative proportion of 2A and 2A1 viruses may differ a little bit. Overall, that is the predominant subgroup, and we're seeing very little of the 3C3A viruses. Um, for the H1N1 viruses, all but one of the H1N1 viruses that we've seen are, belong to the 6B1 genetic group. There is one that belonged to the 6B genetic group. Um, for the B. victoria viruses, all of the B. victoria viruses in the U.S. belong to the V1A genetic group, but this group includes a subgroup with a two amino acid deletion. This subgroup hasn't been given an official des name designation by the WHO collaborating centers yet, so for now we're calling these um, B. Victoria double deletion variants. Um, at this time, the majority of the deletion variants seen worldwide are here in the U.S. And finally, to wrap up with influenza B Yamagata viruses, all of those viruses are within a single genetic group, the Y3 genetic group. This is our antigenic characterization data for viruses collected since May 21st. Um, we do antigenic characterization using post-infection ferret antisera produced against current cell-grown vaccine-like reference viruses. The majority of the viruses are tested using a hemagglutination inhibition assay, but for a subset of the H3N2 viruses, they don't have sufficient hemagglutination titers to um, perform HI testing, and so for those, we use neutralization assays. For the H1N1 PDM09 viruses, all of the viruses are antigenically similar to A. Michigan 45 2015. 
for the H3 and 2 viruses, 113 of 117 or 96.6 percent are antigenically characterized as a Hong Kong 4801 2014-like. The B. Victoria, um, and for the four viruses, H3 and 2 viruses that are that react poorly with ferret antisera against Hong Kong 4801, those viruses all belong to the 3C3A antigenic group. Um, for the B. Victoria lineage viruses, 18 of 28 or 64.3 percent are antigenically characterized as B. Brisbane 60 like. Um, for the B. Victoria lineage viruses that react poorly with um, Anisera against B. Brisbane, um, all of those are the deletion variants. And for the B. Yamagata lineage viruses, all 40 that we tested are antigenically similar to B. Phuket 3073 2013 like. Um, looking at the epidemiologic data for this season, we're starting out with outpatient visits for influenza like illness reported by our ILI net providers. Um, during the week ending October 14th, 2.2% of patient visits were for ILI still, uh, sorry, 1.3% of the visits were for ILI, well below our 2.2% baseline. Um, and if you look at this compared to other recent years, you can see we're right where we typically are for this time of year. Looking at deaths with pneumonia or influenza listed somewhere on the death certificate. Um, this data is from the National Center for Health Statistics, and as you would expect for this time of year, we are still well below our epidemic threshold. Um, for the most recent week that we have data for, which is September 30th, deaths that occurred during the week ending September 30th, 5.3% um, of deaths had um, pneumonia or influenza listed somewhere on the death certificate, and that's compared to the epidemic threshold of 6.0 for that week. So overall low activity, but if you look at the geographic spread of influenza reported to us by state and territorial epidemiologists, you can see we last week we already have five states reporting local activity, which means they are seeing outbreaks or increases in ILI with laboratory evidence of influenza in at least in one region of their state. Um, the majority of states, though, are re 38, are reporting sporadic activity. Um, moving on to the recommendations for the 2018 Southern Hemisphere influenza vaccine. This meeting was held September 25th through the 27th, um, and they recommended that the following viruses be used for trivalent vaccines for the 2018 Southern Hemisphere influenza season. An A Michigan 45-2015 H1N1 PDM09-like virus, an A Singapore INF IMH 16 0019 2016 H3N2 like virus, which for purposes of getting through this talk will be, now be referred to as just A Singapore for the rest of the talk. Um, <laughs> and a B Phuket 3073 2013 like virus. For quadrivalent vaccines, that have 2B components, it'll be the above three plus the Brisbane 60 2008 like virus. Um, relative to the current Northern Hemisphere vaccine viruses, this represents a change in the H3N2 component. The decision to update the H3N2 component was based on global data presented at the vaccine meeting um, in September. And this data showed that most recent H3N2 viruses were well inhibited by ferret antisera produced against cell propagated Hong Kong 4801 2014 like reference viruses, indicating that the viruses have not undergone antigenic drift. However, the proportion of viruses that were well inhibited inhibited by ferret antisera raised against the egg-propagated reference virus was significantly lower. 
Um, it was found that recent H3N2 viruses were better inhibited by ferret anisera raised against the egg propagated A Singapore virus compared to ferret anisera raised against other egg propagated viruses. The change to an A Singapore like virus represents an in incremental improvement in the vaccine strain. It was made not because of significant antigenic drift in the viruses, but because we had identified an egg-based virus and corresponding candidate vaccine virus that's more similar to currently circulating wild-type viruses than the Hong Kong 4801. And the final change that was made was um, for trivalent vaccines, they switched the B lineage that was contained in the trivalent vaccine um, from a Victoria lineage virus to a Yamagata lineage virus. The actual strains didn't change. They just changed which one was in the um, trivalent vaccine. This really has little practical implications for the U.S. because the majority of our vaccine is quadrivalent. So to summarize, um, H3N2 viruses have predominated in the U.S. since July and really worldwide. Um, but we do still see H1N1 and influenza B viruses. So far in the U.S., influenza activity has been low, and the majority of the strains circulating are similar to, to those in our 1718 Northern Hemisphere vaccine. Um, with that, I thank you and would be happy to take any questions you may have. Questions? Yes, Dr. Hunter. Yeah, just um, the slide on pneumonia and influenza mortality mm -hmm. on the epidemic uh, threshold. Am I wrong, or is that is that uh, your assumptions of what the threshold? It seems to be going down slightly every year. It is. It's trending down pretty strongly over the years, um, and it seems to be bec not because. The proportion of deaths due to influenza are lower. It's a reduction in the number, in the proportion of death certificates that have pneumonia listed on it. I'm not sure why that is, but that's that's what's driving the downward trend. Other questions? Okay, I think we'll move on to Dr. Black. Update on surveillance. <laughs> Thanks. I'm Carla Black, and I'll be giving the update on influenza vaccination coverage for the 2016-17 season. Um, we get our coverage data from several sources. The data for children come from the National Immunization Survey flu. You can see the methods listed here. I'll just point out one thing, that these data are based on parental report, so they're not based on provider report like you're used to seeing for other vaccines reported from the NIS. The data source for adults is the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System, and these data are also based on self-report. From both data sources, Kaplan-Meier survival analysis was used to determine cumulative monthly influenza vaccination coverage of at least one dose received from July 2016 through May 2017. And for the estimates of all persons six months and over, we combined data from the NIS and the BRFSS. I will also briefly show vaccination coverage estimates from two special populations, pregnant women and healthcare personnel. Estimates from both of these groups come from non-probability internet panel surveys that were conducted at the end of March and early April of 2017. This figure shows overall influence of vaccination coverage from the 10-11 season through the 2016-17 season. The blue line in the middle is all persons six months and over. And for overall coverage in 2016-17, there was an increase from 45.6% last season to 46.8% in this current season. The data for children is shown in the dashed reddish line at top, on the top. For children, there was an increase in coverage in the 2013-14 season, but since then, coverage has been stable at about 59%. Coverage among adults is shown in the dashed green line at the bottom. In 2016-17, there was an increase in coverage among adults from 41.7% to 
This table shows vaccination coverage among children for more defined age groups in the 2016-17 season. You can see that coverage among children overall was 59%, as I said, and it um, decreases with increasing age from 76.3% among children 6 to 23 months to 48.8% among children 13 to 17 years. Differences from last season are shown in the right-hand column, um, and signif statistically significant differences are footnoted and highlighted in red. Again, overall, there was no change from last season, and this was despite the recommendation to not use LAIV this season. Um, however, you can see that among children 5 to 12 years, there was a decrease in coverage from last season of 1.9 percentage points, and an increase in coverage among children 13 to 17 years of 2 percentage points. In a study that we published in 2015, we found that younger children were more likely to receive LAIV than older children. And in another study that's currently in CDC clearance, we found that overall, only 23% of parents of vaccinated children preferred LAIV for their children in the 2014-15 season. But this percentage differed by child age group, with the highest percentage among parents of children 9 to 12 years at 26.4% expressing a preference for LAIV, and the lowest among parents of the oldest children 13 to 17 years with only 15.3% expressing a, prevalence for, a preference for LAIV. So it's possible the decrease in coverage among children 5 to 12 years could be due to the um, recommendation to not use LAIV last season. However, it's notable that overall coverage did not change among children, and this is likely due to the fact that most parents did not report having a preference for LAIV. This table shows vaccination coverage by race ethnicity among children. Um, for all race ethnicity groups, there was no change from last season. However, within the 2016 season, we see differences by race ethnicity, and non-Hispanic white children have lower coverage than all other race ethnicity groups. This figure shows the trend in coverage among children from the 10-11 season. The youngest children have consistently had the highest vaccination coverage. Their coverage is shown in the lightest blue line at top, um, followed by children 5 to 12 years and the oldest children 13 to 17 years at the bottom. And again, you can see here that decrease in children 5 to 12 years this season and the increase in children 13 to 17 years. This slide shows full and partial vaccination coverage among children six months to eight years based on data from six IIS Sentinel sites. The blue portion of the bars is full vaccination coverage, which is defined as having received the complete number of doses, one or two, that the child needed based on the ACIP recommendations for that season. The yellow portions of the bars represent the percent of children who received only one dose when they were recommended to receive two doses, so this is labeled as partially vaccinated. In the 2016-17 season, full vaccination coverage was 47.4% in the 6 to 23 month age group, 36.7% in the 2 to 4 year age group, and 32% in the 5 to 8 year age group. Compared with last season, there was an increase in full vaccination coverage of 2.4 percentage points among the youngest children 6 to 17 6 to 23 months, but about a one percentage point decrease among children two to four years and five to eight years. Now switching gears to coverage among adults, this figure shows the trend in coverage among adults by age group since the 2010-11 season. Adults 65 and over have consistently had the highest coverage and they're represented in the dark blue, the dark, darkest line at the top. Um, you can see that last season in 2015-16, there was a decrease compared with 2014-15 in adults 65 and over and 50 to 64 years. This season, there was an increase in both of these groups, but it's really just an increase back up to the baseline that we saw prior to the 2015-16 season. And then this is also a breakout of those same numbers for, the, for adults for the 2016-17 season. Um, unlike children, coverage for adults increases with increasing age, ranging from 33.6% in adults 18 to 49 years to 65.3% in adults 65 and over. Um, again, the difference from last season is shown in the column on the right. Overall, there was a 1.6 percentage, 1 percentage point increase in all adults 18 and over, 
And that was mostly driven by an increase of 1.8 percentage points in adults 50 to 64 years and a 1.9 percentage point increase in adults 65 years and over. This table shows coverage by race ethnicity among adults. This season, um, coverage increased among white adults by 1.4 percentage points compared with last season, and there were no differences in any other um, race ethnicity groups. Within the 16-17 season, we see differences by race ethnicity, and unlike children, non-Hispanic white adults have the highest coverage, um, or higher coverage, than all other race ethnicity groups, with the exception of Asian adults who have coverage similar to white adults. Switching gears briefly to show vaccination coverage among pregnant women, in the 2016-17 season, coverage among pregnant women was 53.6%. And since these data come from a non-probability survey, we don't do statistical tests, but instead we use a five percentage point difference as the cutoff for a notable difference. And using these criteria, coverage was similar to the previous four seasons and has been stable at about 50% since the 12-13 season. I can advance. This slide shows coverage among healthcare personnel since the 2009-10 um, season. Coverage in the 2016-17 season among healthcare personnel was 78.6%. Again, according to our five percentage point criteria, this was similar um, to the previous three seasons, um, but it's an increase compared to the 12-13 season. Um, so in conclusion, for children, overall vaccination coverage um, and this, this season was similar to last season. This season, we saw a two percentage point increase for children 13 to 17 years, but it was offset by a similar decrease among children 5 to 12 years. Among adults, coverage increased by 1.6 1, 1. percentage points overall. For all age groups except children 6 to 23 months, coverage remains well below the Healthy People 2020 target of 70%. And coverage among pregnant women and healthcare personnel this season was similar to previous seasons. These data have several limitations. Um, most of them were based on parental or self-report, which could lead to recall bias. We know that we overestimate coverage because we estimated that 149.2 million people were vaccinated, and we know that only 145.9 million doses of vaccine were distributed. <laughs> Response rates... <laughs> Response rates for both the NIS and the BRFIS are low. And for overall estimates, we combine the NIS and BRFIS estimates, um, even though there's differences in survey methodology. Full vaccination coverage among children was not assessed in the NIS flu, and the data from the IAS Sentinel sites might not be representative of the US population. Also, the data for HCP and pregnant women were based on non-probability samples, so these also might not be representative of the U.S. populations of these groups, and we did not do statistical testing on these estimates. And um, a lot of people help work on these estimates, so I would like to acknowledge all the people who contributed. And um, you can find all of these data and more information at our FluVax View website, which is shown here, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Uh, questions for Dr. Black? Yes, Dr. Salaji. Uh, <clears throat> very nice presentation. Thank you. Just a couple quick comments. Um, first of all, I, I want to um, echo what you said. Uh, this is the, the fact that the vaccination rates have not decreased in children, except for a very small amount among 5 to 12 year olds, is a real tribute to the immunization delivery system, given that LAIV no longer exists. And now it's two seasons in a row. Um, so I so just want to echo that. I think it's a real tribute. Many, many people thought that the rates would really drop. Um, the, another point is that I'm really puzzled by why white non-Hispanic children have lower rates, but adults have higher rates. And I'm wondering whether that is also a somehow a reflection of that immunization delivery system, whether the delivery systems that take care of you know, the poor children are actually doing quite well in or better potentially in immunizing kids. Now, I do have a question about um, school located influenza vaccination and that's one area where the um, taking away LAIV might have a real influence and do you have any information on that? I do not, no, sorry. Dr. Reingold. 
Or at least in the Bay Area, we have a school-based immunization program currently funded by a private donor, and we didn't see any decline this year with the removal of LAIV in our program. I also want to just briefly, though, recall that there was a letter in your um, ACIP folder from the last meeting that did describe a county in Florida that did see a decline, so it's likely varies by location. Dr. Kemp. Yeah, this is what I thought uh, Dr. Szilagyi was going to was going to ask you. <laughs> um, I also want to thank you for a great presentation. Um, we've been involved in an influenza project that has demonstrated that our IIS rates are consistently are substantially lower um, for flu um, at estimating flu rates in children than what we see in the NIS, even in mandated reporting states. And I wonder also, given your data that show these sentinel sites are also significantly lower, um, I wonder whether there's consideration about using a different method. I mean, whether self-report for children in the NIS is, is the best method for doing this. Yeah, I don't, and I might call on Michelle Lynn from IS to answer that, because I think from our Sentinel sites, the estimates are pretty close to our NIS estimates. We have looked at NIS estimates, so for children 19 to 35 months and 13 to 17 years, we can get provider-reported estimates um, for flu, and they are a little bit lower than the parental-reported estimates, um, but relying on that we can't get estimates for those children not covered in the other NIS surveys, so we wouldn't have estimates for children between 35 months and 13 years. Um, and also the provider reported estimates have some issues as well because you know, there's record scattering where not all providers, you know, patients have many record, many providers and they don't all, um, they don't all report, so the true, the true estimate is probably somewhere in the middle. Want me to add, Carla? Zikola wanted me to add uh, comments about IS Sentinel site data. I think I would agree with the comment that we're also seeing lower uh, flow coverage in IS Sentinel site data. But uh, regarding the decision, which one to use in the future, um, I don't know. Dr. Masson. Yeah, I, maybe, I mean, we could have a whole debate about some of these topics, <laughs> but maybe just a couple of things, Dr. Slaji. Um, uh, if you look at the NIS childhood data for routine childhood vaccines, um, this one just recently um, published, we actually see discrepancies in socioeconomic status, um, um, in lower socioeconomic status, and in um, racial ethnic minorities, suggesting that the um, safety net of VFC is not working perfectly in those populations. And so I'm not actually sure what to make of this data in comparison to that, but I think it's an interesting question. And to the broader question, I think I can't answer you specifically about what we're doing about flu vaccination coverage, but I would say that for lots of reasons, we are trying to think through how the best way is to continue to estimate vaccination coverage in all our groups. And NIS is an incredibly robust system, but um, it's dependent on people answering the phone and on sort of tracking backwards and verifying valid, um, validating immunization status and all of the systems that we rely on that rely on phone contact, you know, in the current environment are much, much, much more difficult. And so we are having a broader conversation that we could have offline because Nana probably doesn't want to have it here about sort of how to approach, how do we continue to provide you that incredibly important data on vaccination coverage. Dr. Duchin. Thank you. I had a related comment. I was going to ask if we could see some of these data reported with socioeconomic status as one of the variables, um, you know, along with the racial and ethnic um, breakdown. And we have some evidence locally that um, patients of, or people of lower socioeconomic status have higher immunization coverage rates for, for um, vaccines, number of vaccines than um, people who have higher socioeconomic status. For example, children who utilize our school-based health centers have higher vaccination coverage than children who receive their vaccines exclusively in the private sector. So, Dr. Isianola. I was wondering, I thought all the states now have immunization information system. So maybe, uh, so wouldn't that be a more reliable place to be able to look at those coverages? I mean, it doesn't depend on Medicaid or payments that, uh, in my state, everybody have to report that. So wouldn't that be a, a more reliable data to say, 
How many people are currently receiving that? I think that varies by state. Um, I mean, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I think some states it's very robust, other states it's not so great. Yeah, so that's correct. Um, any other questions or comments? Yes. But, but there is an MMWR imminently coming out in November, basically looking at this question, and we'll make sure that that gets sent around to the ACIP members in case you don't see it around sort of the IISs. Thank you. Okay. Thanks so much. Dr. Mallory. Great. So thank you very much for uh, having me present today. I'm Rayburn Mallory. And I'm going to be providing an update on the status of the live attenuated influenza vaccine, also known as Flumist. I'm going to start with an update on the status of the vaccine and an overview of the data that I'm going to be presenting. As you know, LARB showed reduced effectiveness against post-pandemic H1N1 strains in the 2013-14 and 2015-16 seasons. And this led to the ACIP recommendation not to use the vaccine in the US. We now have data from this past 2016-17 season. These data indicate that LARB effectiveness for H3N2 strains was moderate and comparable to seen with the inactivated vaccine, though there was some variation um, for both vaccines by country. In terms of H1N1 strains, we presented the results of our in vitro investigations at the February ACIP meeting. These investigations indicated that reduced replicative fitness is the most likely cause of the reduced effectiveness that was seen. Based on these investigations, we selected a new A. Slovenia H1N1 strain for inclusion in the vaccine for this upcoming 2017-2018 season. Since February, we've been working on improving the ferret model that we use to assess the efficacy of LAIV strains. In this model, in this modified model, the A. Slovenia strain provided greater protection than recent post-pandemic H1N1 strains, and protection that was similar to a previous pre-pandemic highly efficacious strain. In order to further characterize the A. Slovenia strain that's in the vaccine, we conducted a clinical study that's currently wrapping up, and we anticipate having these data in December. We'll present these study results combined with improvements made to the strain selection process, and we anticipate that this will help inform an ACIP recommendation on future use of LAIV in the US within the next four months. So this slide has data from five countries regarding the effectiveness of LAIV. Japan, Finland, Germany, the UK, and Canada. I'm showing H3N2 data as this was the strain that predominated in all of the countries. In terms of study design, there are two studies from Japan. For LAIV, there was a randomized control study conducted in children two through 18 years of age. In this study, all subjects received a single dose of vaccine. For IIV, the study was a test negative study conducted in children under the age of six, all of whom received two doses of vaccine. The study in Finland was a cohort study that enrolled children two years of age while the remaining three studies were all test negative studies conducted in children two through 17 years of age. I've also included on the slide as a reference the effectiveness data for the inactivated vaccine in the US from this past season. And in yellow on the right, consolidated estimates for effectiveness across all of these studies for both LAIV and IIV. As you can see, LAIV demonstrated statistically significant effectiveness for H3N2 strains in this past season, ranging from 28 to 74%. Comparable estimates for the inactivated vaccine range from 34% to 56%. When we look at the consolidated estimates in yellow, both vaccines appear to have had comparable effectiveness with consolidated estimates of 45%. Having presented the H3N2 data, I'm now going to return to the issue of H1N1 effectiveness 
and discuss some of the changes we've made to the ferret model that we've used to assess the effect, efficacy of these trains. So ferrets have been used previously to assess the efficacy of LAIV strains. However, the model hasn't been particularly good at distinguishing between more and less effective strains. This is likely due to the fact that ferrets previously received two doses of vaccine at a fairly high human dose of 10 to the 7 viral particles. In order to help us better differentiate between the LAIV strains, we've reduced the dose to 10 to the 4 viral particles, which is probably a more appropriate dose for ferrets. And the ferrets now receive a single dose of the vaccine. The ferrets were also previously vaccinated with monovalent formulations of the vaccine, while we now vaccinate them with more relevant quadrivalent formulations. Additionally, we made some minor changes to the endpoints of the study. Viral titers are assessed now using the same methods that we use in clinical studies. Fever is monitored nearly continuously using telemetry. And we added neutralizing antibodies to our assessments of immunogenicity. So what I'm showing on this slide are three H1N1 strains that we've evaluated in this ferret model. The H1N1 strains are along the horizontal axis. Some ferrets received a pre-pandemic H1N1 strain, the, the New Caledonia 99 strain, which has been shown in a number of pediatric randomized control trials to have high, high levels of efficacy. Other ferrets received either the recent California 09 strain or the Bolivia 13 strain. Both of these strains have been shown to have reduced effectiveness in recent clinical observational studies. Following vaccination, ferrets were challenged with a wild-type homologous strain. For example, ferrets who were vaccinated with the New California strain, New Caledonia strain, were then challenged with the wild-type New Caledonia strain. And viral titers were collected over the three days following challenge. As you can see from the slide, the New Caledonia strain is highly effective in protecting ferrets from challenge, which corresponds to the clinical efficacy seen for this strain. The California and Bolivia strains showed reduced levels of protection in the ferret model, which again correspond to the reduced levels of effectiveness seen in the clinical observational studies. Having looked at both the California and the Bolivia strains, we then move to look at the new A. Slovenia strain that's included in the vaccine for this upcoming season. What I'm showing on this slide is the exact same data as on the previous slide. The only difference now is that I've added the A. Slovenia data on the far right in the red box. The A. Slovenia strain also showed high levels of protection in ferrets, reducing the titer of shed virus to less than two logs a level of protection that's similar to that seen for the previous highly efficacious A. New Caledonia strain. Because the uh, Slovenia wild-type challenge virus was uh, shed somewhat less by the unvaccinated ferrets, we are in the process of repeating this study, though. This slide, character, this slide summarizes the characterization data we have for the new A. Slovenia strain. As we presented at the February ACIP meeting, A. Slovenia strain has improved replication in primary human nasal epithelial cells compared to the previous A. Bolivia strain and is able to sustain multiple cycles of replication compared to both the A. California and the Bolivia strains. These in vitro characteristics correspond with improved effectiveness in the modified ferret model. We currently have ongoing a clinical study in US children to evaluate how these in vitro and ferret findings correspond with shedding and immune responses to the strain. As I mentioned, we have a study underway that is uh, currently wrapping up to compare the new A. Slovenia strain to the previous A. Bolivia strain that was in the vaccine. The study is being conducted in children 24 to less than 48 months of age, half of whom have no history of being previously vaccinated for flu. And we conducted the study in these subjects 
because we know that for LAIV, immune responses and shedding are higher in younger subjects and in seronaive subjects. We randomized 200 subjects, all of whom received two doses of the vaccine. And subjects were randomized to one of three groups. One group received the current 2017-2018 vaccine formulation that contains the new Ace Slovenia strain. Another group received the previous 2015-2016 vaccine formulation that contains the A. Bolivia strain. And finally, a third group received a 2015-2016 vaccine formulation that only has a single B strain, but still contains the same A. Bolivia strain. The primary endpoint for the study is HAI antibody seroconversion rates. Secondary endpoints include neutralizing antibody responses, mucosal IgA increases, shedding, and safety. The primary objective of the study is really to compare the shedding and immunogenicity of the new A. Slovenia strain to the previous A. Bolivia strain, both given in their relevant quadrivalent formulations. The study does have some limitations. Due to anticipated difficulties in enrolling young children, especially those with no history of prior flu vaccination, the study is small and has only power to evaluate differences of around 20 to 25% in shedding and immune responses. We chose the LAV formulations based on the ones for which we have real-world effectiveness data. So these are the commercial formulations that were distributed in each of the countries. As a result, the, strain, the formulations differ in their H1N1 strains, our main interest, but they also differ in the H3N2 strains, which could potentially affect the results. And then finally, in seropositive subjects, Shedding and seroconversion are somewhat insensitive measures of LAIV efficacy. So to summarize, we have data from five clinical studies that indicate that LAIV was effective for H3N2 strains in this past season, with a consolidated estimate of 45% that appears similar to that seen for inactivated vaccines. In terms of H1N1 strains, as we presented at the February ACIP meeting, our in vitro investigations identified reduced replicative fitness of post-pandemic strains as the most likely cause of reduced effectiveness. And we selected a new A. Slovenia strain for inclusion in the vaccine that has improved replicative fitness. In the modified ferret model, the A. Slovenia strain provided greater protection than that seen for recent post-pandemic strains, Bolivia and California, and protection that appears similar to a previous clinically highly efficacious H1N1 strain, A. New Caledonia. To further characterize the A. Slovenia strain, we are wrapping up a clinical study comparing it to the A. Bolivia strain. We anticipate that the study results, combined with improvements made to the strain selection process, will help inform an ACIP recommendation on use of the vaccine in the US within the next four months. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mallory. Do we have questions, discussion? Anybody? Yes. Just to clarify, the, the H3N2 uh, vaccine studies that you showed, those were all LAIV4, is that correct? Or yes, that's correct. Okay. The question was, was it a quadrivalent formulation used in all of the studies? And yes, it was a quadrivalent formulation. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, now we'll move on to a presentation by Dr. Donahue. Good afternoon. Thanks for the opportunity to speak to you today. Um, I'll be talking about a study that we uh, just published results on where we um, the objective was to uh, determine if there was association between influenza vaccine and miscarriage in pregnant women. So not too much NOIA background. Um, there's a lot of data, a lot of literature out there to support the safety of the vaccine in pregnant women, especially in the second and third trimester, and more and more for the early pregnancy as well. This is a study that's shown here, um, published uh, 2013. 
Uh, Stephanie Irving was the PI. Um, in this study, this was a VSD study, match case control study. Um, women were pregnant in this study either in 2005-6 or 6-7, so before the 2009 pandemic. And the bottom line is that in this study, we found no association between the vaccine and miscarriage. So fast forward then to 2009, and our colleagues at CDC were interested in making sure that the safety profile that we had observed back then was the safety profile we were observing now, the vaccine now containing antigens from the pandemic H1N1. And so this is, a, this is a, a, from the paper that was just published uh, last month. The only difference really between these two studies is uh, the time period, pretty much the same in, sort of, in terms of design and implementation. The real difference though is in the, in the years that were covered. Women were pregnant in 2010-11 and 11-12. Uh, sounds like everybody here is pretty familiar with Vaccine Safety Data Link, so I'll go ahead and pass through that slide. There are eight uh, integrated healthcare plans in VSD, um, all but two pr provided data for this study. So cases were initially identified um, electronically using ICD codes for uh, spontaneous abortion. And all the, all the uh, cases that were used in our study have underwent chart review or medical record review. And in our, in our study, the uh, spontaneous abortion was defined as uh, occurring between five and less than 20 weeks gestation. And all the cases were adjudicated to con not only confirm the SAB, but also to estimate the date. And the, the date that we used for that case was considered the reference date, which I'll refer to later on. And um, that's for each case control pair. So controls were selected similarly, uh, starting out electronically with codes, and then all controls also went, underwent chart review. Controls had to have an LMP that was within seven days of the case LMP. Most were much closer than that. The uh, average uh, or mean pairwise difference was about half a, half a day, and the median pairwise difference was zero days. Vaccine exposures were identified uh, uh, actually from the medical record. And our primary exposure window of interest, as in the previous study, in this, in, in this study was the 28 days before the reference date. We also examined uh, two other exposure windows, 29 to 56 and greater than 56 days. We also extracted um, all of the vaccinations during pregnancy. There were very few other ones other than Tdap. This is a um, match case control study. Uh, we matched on age, age group, so less than 30 years of age and greater than or equal to 30 years of age. We matched on LMP, as I mentioned earlier, as well as site. And because it's a match study, we did a conditional logistic regression. Uh, the models, uh, the covariates that were included in the model are shown there. Uh, maternal age, represented in with a quadratic spline. Smoking, diabetes, uh, concomitant Tdap, um, pre-pregnancy BMI, and previous healthcare utilization. So this slide shows some of the selected characteristics comparing the cases and controls. We had 485 cases and 485 matched controls. I can see that um, cases were slightly older than controls. They were also somewhat more likely to smoke and had a slightly higher BMI. All of those variables were included in the regression analysis models. We also include below those uh, variables um, sort of a, how the, how the uh, cases and controls broke out in terms of their exposure windows, the 21 to 28 days, the 29 to 56, and the greater than 56 days. So among women who were vaccinated in the previous season, and that becomes an important factor, as you'll see in a minute, but among women who were vaccinated in the previous season, 17% were vaccinated also in the 21 to 28 days before the reference date among the cases. Among the controls, 3% were vaccinated in that one to 28 day exposure window. When you look at the other two exposure windows, the 29 to 56 and the greater than 56, kind of similar between the cases and controls in terms of their distribution. So just below that though is a, um, among women who were not vaccinated in the previous season. And you can see then in the one to 28 days, before the reference date, 
pretty much the same proportion of cases and controls were vaccinated. And same on down the line for the other two exposure windows. This next slide shows our overall planned uh, primary analysis. And this is the table where on the left side it shows the three exposure windows. And we see that um, if you look at that one to 28 days highlighted, the odds of, of influenza vaccination in cases compared to controls was about 2.0, uh, with 95% confidence intervals going from 1.1 to 3.6. So it's significant. And this is adjusted for all the things that are listed there. If you look at the other two exposure windows, the 29 to 56 and the greater than 56, the odds ratios are, uh, odds ratios are essentially null. So this was unexpected based on our previous work as well as based on what was in the literature. One of the first questions we, uh, we had was, is this consistent across the seasons? We had two seasons. And they're shown here in this table along with the, the uh, three exposure windows. So on the left-hand side of the table is a 2010-11 uh, season. And you can see that women who were vaccinated in this 2010-11 season, the 1 to 28 days before the reference date, the adjusted odds ratio is 3.7, 95% uh, confidence that it was going from 1.4 to 9.4. And if you look at the other two exposure windows, one is sort of modestly elevated, 1.8, but not significantly so, and the other one is essentially null. And contrast that with the 2011-12 season, where uh, in that 1 to 28 day exposure window, we don't see much of an elevation at all. It's 1.4, not significant. We actually see a protective odds ratio in the 29 to 56 days, although the numbers are pretty small, and the confidence interval is pretty wide. Uh, and below that is the greater than 56 days in the 2011-12 season, and uh, essentially null. So the next question was, is there a possibility, since we're seeing a seasonal difference, is there a possibility that having been vaccinated in the previous season might somehow influence the association between vaccine in the current season and miscarriage? In other words, was there an effect modification from having been vaccinated in the previous season with the association. And that's what's shown in, in this slide here. This is overall uh, looking at effect modification. And so now the, the orientation of this table is a little bit different. The exposure windows are going uh, across the top with one starting with one to 28 days to the left, and then 29 to 56 and greater than 56. And on the left-hand side, you see uh, essentially kind of stratified whether or not they were vaccinated in the previous season, yes or no. If they were vaccinated in the previous season, the odds ratio in the 1 to 28 day exposure window was 7.7. Pretty broad confidence for intervals going from 2.2 to 27, just a little over 27. If they were not vaccinated in the previous season, the odds ratio is pretty close to null, 1.3, not significant. So if you look at the other two exposure windows, the 29 to 56, greater than 56, really nothing going on there. So then the next question after that was, is there a possibility that we're seeing seasonal differences with respect to the effect modification analysis? And here's where, where we start getting into very small numbers. <laughs> but the table is oriented again, as, uh, as it was earlier. Uh, and this is for the 2010-11 season. And so if women who are in the 2010-11 season in our study, if they were vaccinated in the previous season, they could have been vaccinated with the monovalent H1N1 vaccine. They could have been vaccinated with the seasonal vaccine. They could have been vaccinated with both or neither. So women who were vaccinated with the monovalent H1N1 in the previous season, regardless of whether or not they had vaccination with the seasonal vaccine, had an odds ratio in the 1 to 28 days of 32.5. Very broad confidence intervals going from just under 3 to 359. Going across, if you look at the other two exposure windows, uh, these are elevated somewhat, but not significantly so for the 29 to 56. And it's just marginally significant for the greater than 56 uh, with their odds ratio of 3.2. If women were vaccinated with both vaccines, both the monovalent and the seasonal, 
The odds ratio is 31.5, similar to the one above with uh, even broader confidence intervals. And not much happening, uh, again, modestly elevated, but not significantly so in the other two exposure windows. And then finally, if they were vaccinated with a seasonal vaccine only or unvaccinated, the odds ratio in that one to 28 day exposure window is about the same, just a little over three and not significant. So, um, and then there's nothing going on in the other uh, uh, two exposure windows. So that was in the 2010-11 season. This is in the 2011-12 season. Table again the same way. Uh, in this case, women who were in our study in 11-12, they were vaccinated in the previous season, they would have been vaccinated with a seasonal vaccine, which would have had the pandemic H1N1 antigen in it. If they were vaccinated in the previous season, the odds ratio in that one to 28 day exposure window is 6.4, marginally significant, with confidence intervals going from 1.0 to 41. If they were not vaccinated in that prior season, in that one to 28 day window, the odds ratio is 0 0.7. In the 29 to 56, you actually see a protective odds ratio in the unvaccinated, um, even smaller numbers there. And then there's essentially no results in the greater than 56 day window for both the vaccinated and unvaccinated in the prior season. So we had a, a number of questions, additional questions when we saw some of these results. One obvious question was whether women who had early pregnancy loss were somehow different than controls. And more specifically, were cases more likely than controls to be vaccinated because they presented with early signs and symptoms of spontaneous abortion. So we went back to the data and we got all the diagnoses that were assigned on the date of vaccination for both cases and controls. And we found that cases were indeed more likely to have been vaccinated, more likely to have a diagnosis, at least one, on that date of vaccination, 58% versus 52, but that is not a significantly different uh, not a significantly larger difference. You're also somewhat more likely to have um, a mean number of diagnoses than were controls. 1.7 versus 1.6. Again, not different significantly. Most of these diagnoses were V codes, routine pregnancy visit, um, vaccination visits. We did have three cases, no controls, who in that one to 28 day exposure window had diagnoses of specific miscarriage symptoms, bleeding, spotting, cramping, that sort of thing. And we excluded these three pairs and we ran the analysis for the overall effect modification analysis. The um, odds ratio was 7.0 in the one to 28 day exposure window and the uh, confidence interval went from 1.9 to 25. So this slide shows um, a summary of some of the additional post-hoc analysis that we did. The first two rows you've heard about. The third one there, uh, we excluded all women who had a history of two or more spontaneous abortions. It's about 64 uh, match pairs. When we did that, and we did the effect modification analysis, and all these results are for the one to 28 day exposure window. But when we did that, the odds ratio for women who were vaccinated in the previous season, the odds ratio in that one to 28 day exposure window was 6.5, with confidence intervals going from 1.7 to 24. If they weren't vaccinated, it was odds ratio was 1.1 um, and not significant. We also excluded vaccine manufacturer. Um, there were a number of people, cases and controls, about eight versus 6% or 4%, who didn't have um, <clears throat> a vaccine manufacturer when we excluded them, the odds ratio was 5.9 for women who were vaccinated in the previous season versus 1.2. And then we also uh, restricted our analysis to women who had at least one ultrasound. Uh, when we did that, the uh, odds ratio was 6.9. Um, confidence interval going from 1.7 to 28 compared to 1.3. <clears throat> Excuse me.
And then we also tried to get at whether women were infected with influenza. That was something we knew we probably couldn't get a very good handle on. We really need to have a prospective study testing women with ILI. But we did adjust for a diagnosis of influenza, and as you can see it didn't really change much of anything. So to summarize our key findings, we found that uh, miscarriage was significantly associated with um, IIV receipt in the 28-day exposure window. Um, this was something that was different and we didn't expect. We also found that this association between the vaccine and miscarriage was significant in the 2010-11 season overall, but not in 11-12. But in both seasons, the association, ele association was elevated only in the 28-day window and only in women who had been uh, who had received a pandemic H1N1 vaccine in the prior influenza season. So there are a number of criticisms that have been uh, that this study has received. A lack of biological plausibility is is one of those, and that is definitely true. We don't we we have no established way to explain our findings, but there are multiple examples of vaccine and drug related adverse events that have been identified without any known biological plausibility a priori. It's also true that early SABs, which most of ours are, are likely due to chromosomal abnormalities. Like 50 to 60 percent of all spontaneous abortions have, uh, are likely due to result of chromosomal problems. This is true, uh, but misclassification in that case should be non-differential not related to vaccine. And the bias in that case would be towards the null in most instances. Another criticism that's also uh, very accurate is small sample size in some analyses. Um, guilty as charged there. Um, the overall uh, analysis, the planned analysis, I think is pretty stable. And I also think it's what's fairly stable is the analysis with the um, uh, overall effect modification. We get into very shaky ground, thin ice when we start looking at some of the more sub-analyses. We're doing another study, which I'll tell you about in just a minute, um, where we'll have about three times as many people. Hopefully some of those sample size issues will go away. We also had crude matching. Some thought maybe inadequate adjustment for age because we matched in groups on uh, what the cut point was 30 years of age. But all of our logistic regression analyses included age in the analysis as an analysis factor. And then finally, we, didn't, we did not adjust for history of spontaneous abortion. And that is based on prior work that had showed that there was a possibility of introducing bias when you do that. We did, however, as I, as I alluded to earlier in the, in the table, we did exclude those who had two or more, a history of two or more spontaneous abortions. And the odds ratio was similar, somewhat reduced, but still similar. So this all led to some additional questions, obviously, some additional concerns, which we hope to address when we do this uh, study that is currently ongoing. The study is similar to the previous studies in terms of its design, also in terms of uh, the age uh, group of women who are in the study. Uh, eligibility criteria are similar. Exclusion criteria are similar. Cases and controls will be ascertained pretty much in the same way. Exposure will be both from medical record as well as from electronic uh, vaccine data in, in BSD. And then the medical record review is also going to be an important part of this. We're actually going to try and get a little bit more uh, extensive information from the charts that will help us determine um, why women were vaccinated. Why were they in there? We can try and document the chief complaint, the setting, uh, those kinds of things. There are some differences, though, with, this, uh, with the previous study. In the previous study, the objective was to estimate the overall association between vaccine and miscarriage. The follow-up study is actually going to focus more on women who were vaccinated or not in the previous season. 
the study period um, I mentioned, we're going to have three seasons in the follow-up uh, study, 2012, 13, 13, 14, and 14, 15. And the overall study is going to be about three times the size. So corresponding, we, we should have about 80% power, same amount of power for each season, whereas we only had 80% power to take an odds ratio of about two um, with both seasons combined in the previous study. So we were, we were interested in having more power to do a, a seasonal specific analysis because we did, saw, we did see those uh, differences by season. Matching is going to be similar, although we will be um, matching with uh, three age groups instead of just two. And we're also going to be um, matching on vaccination in the previous season. And then finally, a minor difference is um, the previous study included stillbirths as, as uh, potential controls. We had very few uh, stillbirths, and so we're just going to go with um, women with live births as um, our controls. So our timeline for this study, uh, as I mentioned, this is a study that's currently underway. We hope to have preliminary results by late next year or early the following year. And there are a lot of people who worked on this study in BSD, and I'd just like to thank them all. That's it. Thank you very much. Questions? Yes, Dr. Ryan. So very, very interesting. Thank you. So I guess I have two questions. One is, that I would have thought that vaccine use of flu vaccine in women in this age group who weren't pregnant would be rather infrequent. Um, so vaccination in the prior season, I wonder how correlated that is with uh, gravidity and para, parity uh, in terms of being having been pregnant in the previous year. So I assume that's something you controlled for. I honestly can't remember, but can you tell us something about why these women were getting vaccinated the previous year? Um, why were they getting vaccinated the previous year? No, we actually don't have that information, uh, specifically why they were getting vaccinated. That's one of the things we want to capture. Um, but, but you have data on, gra on, on gravity and, and parity, yes? Those are controlled for in the analysis? We have it for the current season, the, the season in which they are currently vaccinated. So my, my other just small point would be um, odds ratios are great, but but... For something like this, it also might be useful to calculate an, an excess risk and a population attributable risk to sort of give some perspective on just how much of a of a problem this would be if it's real. Uh, yeah, so that's an important point that we didn't really get into in the, in the talk here, but these are odds ratios. It's an observational study. It's a, these are odds ratios. If the, if the, if the, if the um, outcome is rare, then odds ratios often are a pretty good representative of relative risk and... You no, know, I don't have any trouble with them being odds ratios, but... but, but no, but I, you were asking about attributable risk, right? Well, excess risk and population attributable yeah, risk. Yeah, we can't get at this at all with... Uh, that kind of measure we can't get at with a case control study like this. Uh, I'm not sure you're right about that, but... This is a, one of the things that makes this different than a lot of odds ratios, or a lot of case control studies, is that the outcome is common. So right there, that makes it difficult to make... Uh, uh, comparisons between odds ratio and, and say, relative risk. Dr. Riley. So doesn't that beg the question of whether this is the right study to be done to look at spontaneous abortion? You mean because study design? Study design to look at spontaneous abortion because it's one of those things that is incredibly common. There's a million different reasons why they occur. Yes, you know, 60% may be, 50 to 60% may be chromosomal abnormalities, which also makes the biologic plausibility here even harder to understand. But I guess I'm, I'm actually concerned that, okay, here we have a signal, and now we're going to follow it up with maybe not the ideal study design to actually answer the question in a way that people need. I mean, I think what I would want to know as a clinician and what I would want to know as, an, as a patient is, you know, what is, the, what is the attributable risk to me getting a flu vaccine? Not, not this. No, you, you, yeah, this, this study so, will not be able to give an attributable risk. So there are, there are a number of trade-offs for different study designs. We actually had a, 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 a meeting at, with, within VSD of, among the investigators to try and figure out what's the best study design. So we tossed around a number of different study designs. And from all taking all things into consideration, practical considerations as well as scientific ones, 
mask case control is again the way to go. Dr. Belanja. So, and I completely uh, agree that what we would really like to know is what is the excess risk uh, associated with flu vaccination uh, um, in, in the setting where there's already a risk from many other things. And the excess risk may, risk may be very low, even if the odds ratio appears to be relatively high. It may account for a very tiny proportion. Unfortunately, this design doesn't get at it, and uh, through all of our discussions in VSD, we haven't really come up with any other options other than a very large multi-year cohort study. And um, that doesn't seem very feasible at, at the moment. It would take a long time to implement. And so the mo most immediate question is, you know, was what we observed in those two seasons an anomaly or not? And if we at least replicate the study and we don't find it again, um, then, you know, we still won't know exactly what happened, but at least we can be confident that there's, there's no reason to be concerned still. But if, if we do find it, then it does raise the question is we really don't know what the excess risk is. Dr. Kemp. Yeah, I wanted to uh, verify. I, I didn't quite understand um, what you presented about the timing of the vaccine versus presentation for SAB. Were you able to discern how many of those people got the vaccine on the same visit? So you're talking about the analysis where, you, where we were trying to find out if there was protopathic bias, essentially? Is Yes, or, or presentation bias. Yeah, yeah. You know. So, yeah, we were, so at the time the diagnosis was assigned, we were able to, to uh, get the vaccinations that were also, back. If, I'm sorry, if they were, if they, if they were vaccinated, on a, we, we know the dates of vaccination, we simply went back and got all the diagnoses that were assigned on that date. Okay, so you essentially controlled for for if they got the vaccine on the same day as the diagnosis? So what we, we, okay. what we did was say, well, is there a possibility that they came in because of cramping or whatever, <laughs> pain, and they got a vaccine because they came in because for that reason? And so in that case, essentially, it's working opposite the way you want in terms of not the vaccine driving the outcome, it's the outcome driving the exposure. So I have another question that's probably for Laura <laughs> or somebody else in the crowd. Um, what percent of very early SABs present for care? And might there not be uh, some ascertainment bias in people that know they got a shot and are worried about that issue? Yeah. I mean, I think that that's what our concern is, is that, you know, not that many people, lots of people don't know they've had a miscarriage. They have a heavy period. You don't know whether that's a miscarriage or just a heavy period. So that's one. The second thing is, is that, um, you know, it's not standard to get an ultrasound in the first trimester for absolutely everybody, especially this early, particularly where we're doing prenatal diagnosis so often at 10 weeks and 12 weeks. So we're not offering people an ultrasound at five and a half and six weeks. So lots of people, we don't even have a pregnancy established. So for the 20% of the people who didn't have a pregnancy have an ultrasound where you even know the pregnancy was established, it still just leaves you a little bit questionable, I would say. Ms. Pellegrini. Thank you. Um, so my colleagues on ACIP know that my day job is at the March of Dimes, where our mission is healthy pregnancies and healthy babies. So this study provoked a great deal of conversation. And one of the things to follow up on points a couple of other folks have made that came up um, was that yes, 50 to 60% of those early spontaneous abortions are chromosomal abnormalities. Another roughly 30% have normal chromosomes but morphological abnormalities. And so the, the percentage of cases here that are even potentially being affected by the flu shot is very small. So I think when you combine that with the small n in this study and the lack of some other key data that we'd really like to know, um, that, that causes us a lot of, just a lot of questions, a lot of uncertainty here. So for example, one of the other data elements that it would be really useful to, um, to have is the date of the most recent pregnancy before the one that was lost. 
We know, for example, that rapid repeat pregnancies in less than 18 months um, are much more susceptible to adverse birth outcomes, including miscarriage. So again, given the small numbers here, it doesn't, we're not sure we have the full picture. Thank you. Dr. Plotkin. So I may have missed this in the bleachers, but do you have information about uh, respiratory illnesses in these women? So that was a question we tried to address by going, we went back to the data to, to capture all uh, diagnoses for influenza. And we didn't, we didn't capture all diagnoses for respiratory illness in general or acute respiratory illness, but we did capture them for uh, influenza diagnoses. And we had, we, we didn't expect really to get too much, and we didn't because, you know, just we just don't have a good uh, well, capability to identify the, them. Yeah. The reason I asked the question is that it has been demonstrated fairly clearly that uh, women who, or men for that matter, who have serial vaccinations, that is to say one year after the next, and the strain doesn't change between years, that they have a lower efficacy of influenza vaccine and therefore less protection against influenza, which is, uh, I mean, one of the reasons why one vaccinates pregnant women. Yeah, it would be nice to be able to, to identify people who were actually infected with influenza. But that's difficult to do unless you do a prospective and study. And I have mean, I, I think that's an important variable in in, in looking at mm -hmm. this situation. Do they have illnesses that, in the, in the in itself, could precipitate abortion? Thank you. Uh, any more burning questions, comments, Dr. Lee? Thanks, Jim. I just wanted to say thank you for presenting. I know this is like one of the toughest topics to study um, in all of vaccine safety, so you've tackled the most difficult one of all. So um, kudos to you. A couple of things that I just wanted to um, ask about, because I, I do think that this question of, um, and I don't, know if, I don't know if I saw it, was the average gestational age in terms of the timing of the SAB, um, whether or not that's something you presented, I might have missed it. Um, and then related to that, sort of, if it's possible to do some type of sensitivity analysis on whether or not the LMP dating is accurate, because that can be really challenging, um, uh, depending on sort of how it was validated. Yeah, so to address the last question first, we, we don't have a sensitivity analysis that will be done in this study, but we are planning to do one for the subsequent study. And um, regarding the gestational age, the, the median gestational age for cases in our study was seven weeks gestational age. And it's a, it's a pretty, I probably should have brought this, but it's a pretty steep curve that goes up, peaks around six, seven, eight weeks. And then um, the vast majority, maybe 90, 99th, percent are, are um, by 10 weeks gestational age. Alanja. Um, just to uh, follow up on, on Dr. Plotkin's comment, as I recall, you know, we did look at febrile illnesses during the period prior to the miscarriage, and that was not accounting for, so, that, that was relatively uncommon, as I recall. So, yeah, I was going to actually think about that, too. We, we looked at febrile illness in, uh, I think, the first three months, as well as the first two weeks preceding the actual illness. We had only three or four um, cases that had febrile illness in that interval, at least in the two weeks before. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, moving on to Dr. Groskoff. Thank you very much. I'm just going to provide a brief overview of um, one very brief recommendations update, as well as um, some of the work group discussion that occurred on some of these topics. I just want to thank very briefly all of the CDC SMEs that um, helped contribute to this meeting, everyone also who presented today, um, and everyone who um, sits with us and attends work group calls. Um, a very quick update regarding the 2017-18 recommendations. Um, as um, Dr. Walter mentioned, these were published on August 25th. Um, we have had one licensure change since publication that I just wanted to highlight briefly, and that's um, that a Fluria quadrivalent, which is an inactivated influenza vaccine quadrivalent, or IIV4, manufactured by Securius, um, previously licensed for ages 18 and older, is now licensed for ages 5 and older. Um, we will not be reprinting the MMWR 
are. However, um, this information has been updated on the table of available vaccines on the Influenza Division web pages and also on the brief summary of the recommendations that you can find on the ACIP page. Um, Next, um, two slides discussing um, some of the work group discussion, just very briefly summarizing some of the concepts that were discussed when two of these topics were presented. Um, with regard to the LAIV update, um, we were fortunate to get um, a presentation of the same information that you all have seen today. Um, some of the work group discussion topics included various aspects of design and analysis um, in the various studies, for example, the US um, non-US observational studies, and also um, some general discussion of um, adequacy of shedding as a correlate of protection um, when it comes to live attenuated influenza vaccine. Um, there has been no policy change with regard to the live attenuated influenza vaccine that's um, proposed for this meeting. We are looking forward to hearing the pediatric shedding study results um, uh, in the very near future. Um, and also um, for the um, upcoming meeting, um, we anticipate having a discussion of analysis of combined data from the US studies, um, as well as a discussion of a systematic review of post-pandemic LAIV effectiveness. Um, next, um, with regard to the study presented by Dr. Donahue just now, um, as was mentioned at um, the introduction to our session, um, these data, the study was presented initially um, to the work group and also at ACIP for 2015. I believe the, the June 2015 meeting was when the ACIP first heard um, some of the data. Um, the work group had another opportunity to hear the data um, post-publication. Um, some of the discussion included, um, for example, the early median gestational age of the um, SAB events, um, which is um, characteristic of spontaneous abortion events in general, um, which um, again highlighted some of the difficulties, some of which have been discussed today, of studying this particular event. Um, it's difficult to study, of course, prospectively. Um, as was mentioned, um, women may not even necessarily know they've had a miscarriage at the time they have it. They may not know that they were pregnant at the time they're exposed to a vaccine or um, or any other, uh, any other aspect. Um, there was a little bit of discussion about biologic plausibility, um, and this relates to the next bullet. Um, it was also noted that uh, the findings seem to be driven by the earlier season, the 2010-11 results primarily. There's a decrease in the magnitude of the association from the first season under study to the second. It has to be pointed out, though, that the confidence intervals are fairly wide. We have a situation where, as we stratify data, of course, as you saw by various seasons and by whether or not there was a vaccination during the previous season, we have um, estimates based on relatively small numbers and relatively wider confidence intervals. Nonetheless, the decrease in the magnitude of the association was something that was noted and discussed a little bit. Um, and one thing was that was under discussion was, you know, what is what might be unique about H1N1 PDM09 in particular, um, particularly as this was not seen with the earlier study of very similar design. Um, there is a discussion of this work in the background materials for the current season, 2017-18 um, statement. Um, it wasn't yet published at the time we went to publication, um, so the, the information referenced is still the um, ACIP presentation from June 2015, but we have referenced this information in the ACIP guidance for the current season and also for the 16-17 season. We also discussed the various other studies conducted previously to this one that did not note an association between um, spontaneous abortion and receipt of influenza vaccine. Um, no policy change was proposed for this meeting. The current language um, states that influenza vaccine can be given at any time during pregnancy, before and during the influenza season. Um, an age-appropriate inactivated or recombinant vaccine is what's recommended. And um, we're looking forward to the results of the follow-up study described by Dr. Donahue. And that's all I have. Thank you. I'd be happy to take any questions. Any quick questions for Dr. Groskopf? Okay, seeing none, we're going to take a 10-minute break.